little bat's gonna hide from me. Well, guess what? I was born into the dark. You thought I was running from you, Bane. I brought you here on purpose. All you do is hide, Bat Knot. I'm right here. Shadows remains Batman. We still go to Arkham Silent. <laughs> Hello, little bats. Round two. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on again. Oh, absolutely. You, a long time ago, I think this was actually, like, there's always, like, two or three things that you wanted to always talk about, and you wanted to talk about Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy for a while, and then you, you, you said it, like, all right, we're doing it. Let's go. Yep, yep. This is one of my favorite trilogies of all time. Top three, for sure. Oh, my gosh. And there's something about it, I, I the reason why I've been wanting to do this for a while is with, with you as well, there's something about this movie, movie that kind of causes... It's like a drama, but it happens to be around superhero aspects. And I would say probably no movie has done it better so far than these three movies right here. And we just uh, were talking today about this. And I, I, I tell you what, man. First of all, Dark Knight might be the best movie of all time. But the whole, the, all three of them really stand alone as being like so good they like they're almost in the same kind of tier as like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and whatnot. And they kind of like they, they enter that whole uh almost perfect movies. What do you think? Um yeah, and before we start I wanted to say thanks for uh having me on the show and like bringing me out of my comfort zone and getting me to do and say things I wouldn't normally do if I wasn't ever on the podcast like encourage anyone else who considering coming on just do it. It'll You'll get better over time. My first one you watch of me, I'm super nervous and terrified, and you just get better as you do it. So thanks again. <laughs> yeah, of course, buddy. It's one of those things too. Since high school, you did these little things with us, but you could tell you were very timid about it. But seeing your sister and everyone, how they were very, you know, they were very outward with the way they sung and whatnot. I'm thinking, and I've heard you sing too. You just you, you always try to like make fun of yourself and whatnot. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you were always a good singer too. So I always thought, dude, you, we've done stuff like this. You just just own it and you get yeah, I appreciate it. yeah you get better and better and better so thanks yeah um yeah everyone I hope to get a little bit better on but uh what was your question on the movies like just general thoughts on it like oh no it's just it's just this is these are three movies that I've been really excited to talk about because and I'll get to this with you later I would say pound for pound I have a couple complaints but pound for pound this is these are like considered like not only some like like the one of the best trilogies of all time but just 
one of them, especially one of the best movies of all time. And in fact, on IMDb, what uh, I go for, and I know you do sometimes too, it's like ranked number four or three. So it, it, it tells you right mm -hmm. there how it really resonates with people. And I think the reason, my friend, is because it's a drama about a superhero. Yeah, I mean, as a little kid, I used to watch Batman, like, was it Adam West or one of those guys? <laughs> it almost felt like, in the cartoons, a little bit, but the, this is what, even the, like, original uh, Michael Keaton ones, those were good, but these ones really, really got me to become a Batman fan. It's like, wow, this this is good. Storytelling, good action, good mm -hmm. fight scene, just, <clears throat> and all three of them were equally good, like, they're they just one of them edges out the other one, and the other one edges out the other one. They're just great movies. <laughs> and all and three, like we, all three of them, all, and all three of them have a certain kind of appeal too about them. And I like how they kind of start off Batman because in the original Batman movies that we all saw, we always saw Batman as already Batman. And now, yes, now a lot of movies that we see, there's always that origin story. But we we always needed like a real one with Batman. We only got the whole. Oh, my mom and dad were murdered by someone, and now I'm Batman. Well, now we have a little more of, of a, a backstory on how he kind of dealt with the, the anger issues and, and being an orphan and all that kind of jazz and what it did to him, and then the right kind of people and the wrong kind of people getting into his life and shaping him. And it, it was a very convincing tale uh, that this world that we're watching is not unrealistic because it's a superhero movie. It's... it's Centered around science, which I like. Batman's not sitting there flying around because he got some. He got bit by some kind of radioactive bat. He's got, you know, the military technology. Since he's the, the richest man in the world, he's able to use it. Everything just kind of makes sense. Yeah, it was real realistic of the Batman. It wasn't like he has superpowers or anything. He was. He just had really good technology, like you said, like a Tony Stark in some ways, but not quite as extreme. <laughs> Exactly, and and yes, Tony Stark can and build can build stuff and whatnot, and Batman usually has someone doing it for him. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That's a good way. That's a good parallel. They're kind of, and I would say, oddly enough, because Iron Man was never even in that top tier of, of, you know, like quality like people wanted, like they got from Batman. But luckily, Rob Downey Jr. and Marvel brought that to him. But, but, Batman has this special thing. That's why he's. Done, been redone so many times and we're about ready to see a Robert Pattinson movie coming out here in like a month so it tells mm -hmm. you right there like it, this, this is one of those things where people love Batman so much you can reinvent it a million times over and people are going to get a kick out of something new and refreshing possibly and I would say and I think you agree with this that, that the Christopher Nolan version is still to this day probably considered the most tight like like beautiful like somber big old long story that's not kind of like corny at times, whatnot. The whole movie is very convincing, and yes, it happens to be about a superhero too. So let's go ahead and start from the first one, and just talk about our experiences and you know what uh, what we liked, what we didn't like about them, and we can go and build up and see. Uh, well, yeah, we'll start with Batman Begins, and yeah. So yeah, we're kind of used to the story of him being a kid and his parents getting killed by someone in the street. So I'm glad, real quick, that the new Batman they said they aren't going to have that because they. It's been done many times. But this new one was cool because you showed like how he, he he learned his fighting style, whatever you want to call it, how to fight and become who he was. His, his biggest fear were bats, and he turned that into his biggest, I don't know, strength, but just his identity, I guess. Sure, yeah, he turned, but, it, he turned a fear into a power. Absolutely. Yeah. So were the... Was, the Raza Ghoul, was that the name of the clan or what was that again? Uh, no, that the League of Shadows was the name of the clan. And if, and, no. they, and they're really cool because, first of all, Batman is trained by technically the most, uh, I guess, secretive yet they've done the most damage to this world over centuries and centuries. And in the, in the first movie, Liam Neeson's telling him, he's like, yeah, we've been doing this since like the Roman days, like the, they were, I think they were implying like that, like the fall of the, 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 the great fall of the Roman empire was due to the League of Shadows. The, all the, the tyranny that was happening in London was all due to the League of Shadows. I guess they've been, what happens, what they would say, which is amazing and kind of uh, like Thanos style is the moment civilization gets too high and mighty, we bring them down a couple notches again. And mm -hmm. the reason why that's somewhat intriguing is because as Thanos also stated, it's kind of, there's a, there's a certain kind of, understanding that that 
you get from that, you kind of see what they're where they're coming from, and any villain that you can kind of understand their point of view is already going to be a good villain. Mm-hmm. And there were like two, three villains in this first one. Mm-hmm. Scarecrow, who they kind of mixed in like a week, not a week, but like I guess I just like the mixture of villains they put in these three movies too. Like they even said in the third one they were gonna do the Riddler, I guess, but they decided to do someone more brute force. So that's what I went with Bane. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was a good mixture of different types of villains and it was pulled out very well by the actors they had um and luckily they weren't they didn't overshadow each other either that's a problem with when you watch something like batman and robin or uh, and that may be an extreme uh movie we'll even say possibly how about batman forever yeah. there's there's a few characters and they're really over the top and it, it's a fun movie it's not a bad movie at all but they they do kind of tend to sometimes get a little bit on the side of corny and like over and and just like in your face and campy but then you have these kind of characters like scarecrow first of all the the actor uh, killian murphy i i love him and everything he's ever been in he's always very convincing actor so whenever i remember seeing him in 28 days later you're like oh cool this guy's great i'm actually i've seen the movie with you in fact i think we saw it in the movie theater together but then you see him as a bad guy and you're like i just you just keep on forgetting that there's so many of these well-rounded uh, men and women that are in these movies that make the, the, these movies so well. Uh, w- whenever they introduced Commissioner, well, I guess it would be Lieutenant Gordon, uh, but Gary Oldman, the actor, I'm thinking, you guys are just bringing the A squad. and that mm. So that alone was something worthy. But then when you have that tight-knit uh, script and whatnot, and you have the coming age, the hero's tale, but done in such a dramatic, like you're watching Goodwill Hunting kind of way, it's, it's, it's very different. Yep, the bad guys actually felt like bad guys. They weren't like kind of jokers like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mr. Freeze. That was a little like, oh my god, <laughs> wasn't so cheesy and kitty. It was you were actually concerned about Batman's health because he wasn't. I don't know. Just no, and, you, and you're and you're right because the villains are never supposed to be uh, silly and corny. Doctor Freeze's his whole backstory is really sad. His wife has some kind of special uh, like cold cancer or something and the only way so he was trying to find the, the cure for her so he froze her and then he kind of starts kind of losing his mind while doing it these stories aren't really mentioned that well in those kind of movies but luckily with dark knight first of all a lot of people didn't even know scarecrow very well that that, that yeah. wasn't very familiar with batman and then this guy character came out and the cool thing about that was the the stuff that they introduced that kind of like the fear toxin that make you scared that, that wasn't so far-fetched that I'm sitting there going, yeah, no, this is a stupid campy movie. What am I watching? And then the mm-hmm. actors and everything, they're all convincing to like they're trying to be in a movie that's supposed to be uh, an Oscar winner. And and you can see um, immediately when watching Batman Begins, it was they were completely saying, okay, the stuff that you're used to, we're not doing that anymore. It's not going it, to... It's going to be uh, refreshing, different from Tim Burton's version... Uh, but still has that wonderful edge to it that makes Batman kind of intimidating in the first place. The whole fear, hiding the shadows and whatnot. But Christian Bale, picking him, was one of the greatest strengths you could have possibly done. And a lot of people don't realize that Christian Bale has an extensive acting career that go, goes back to uh, Emperor of the Sun, which was a 1987 uh, movie in World War II that was that, that he was a kid just trying to survive. Uh, World War One, sorry. And it's just, you see this guy transform all these characters, and all of a sudden you find out he's going to play in Batman. And it's very rare because typically people in costumes playing these little characters are not necessarily considered to be like A star actors. And then it's all of a sudden here comes all these people. Christopher Nolan had a couple of movies under his belt, but he still wasn't necessarily well known yet. All these people that were very talented, and then you, you make this movie with this cohesive project. I mean, and then Hans Zimmer, the composer, uh, James Newton Howard, another composer that came in and helped him. It, the the Batman Begins was already a start in the right direction, big time. Was this one of the like, only movies where Liam Neeson's the bad guy into? Because you we know him in Qui Gon Jinn, like Taken movies, and a few others where he's always the hero, usually. So it's kind of different and cool to see him in a different role. At least for me, I don't think I've seen him as a bad guy. But he was pretty good, like, convincing. Yeah. Yes, so. there's another movie I saw him in a long time ago when he was a mortician and he was making this girl believe that she was dead. 
and that she mm-hmm. was in some kind of purgatory and he was just really just locking her in a room and uh, it was, uh, so he was kind mm-hmm. of but he had the same demeanor he has in a lot of his movies where he has that very calm demeanor like even in uh, Raja Ghul in Batman he was when you think of like League of Shadows this 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 terrorist organization that's not just terror they're like the whole world like they've been shaping the way this whole world's been since the beginning of existence and then mm-hmm. this and then he just has such a very like calm and collective way about him and it's very like ooh you think that they, they would have went with more of like a do you know who I am no, but no they, they're yeah. like they're just like no I'm gonna train you because I can sense, sense that you, you know you had there's something a fire inside you and there's something about you and then by the end of that little whole first act you find out oh my gosh that that whole like Ken Watanabe uh, Asian guy that was flinging his his like me, uh, beard in the corner, he was just like your hype man. He was just sitting there like as like a he was fake. You're the real bad guy at this. And then yes, uh, you have a scarecrow just kind of sprinkled in there to kind of cause panic and whatnot. But at the end of the day, you're the real uh, uh, shaper of this whole thing. And and we'll talk about uh, his situation in Dark Knight Rises because technically that actually that. The villains for Dark Knight Rises very much have to do with him too. So talk about like a yep. full story of like oh consequences, good and bad. Yeah, here we are. Mm-hmm. Yep. So do you want to move on to the second movie? Uh, yes. Uh, well, yeah, I, I just want to say um, first the first movie things I liked uh, did not like that as much. Katie Holmes as Rachel Dawson. I have never. Like yeah, I've never really. I mean, she's she's nice to look at and whatnot, but I've never really been a fan of her as an actor. And I, I, I she was okay in Dawson's Creek and cute little movies like that. And there was a good movie that she was in an indie movie called Pieces of April. But for the most part, I could see like all the amazing actors and all this amazingness together. And then when she was standing next to all of them doing her acting thing, it's almost like I was just watching it, going like, "Yeah, I don't, I don't buy it, maybe." <laughs> really. Yeah. I actually felt the opposite, but I don't. I didn't really rate her off. Maybe her acting as much as you did. I was, maybe she was easier to look at than you know, than the newer Rachel. Which I was going to ask you, why did she not come into the second movie? There, there was no a uh, real official reason. But what happened was she got a lot of hate mail from people like me. I don't do that kind of stuff, but people like me who said that she did not do a very good job. I guess wrote a lot of mail saying you just screwed up a damn near perfect movie. And so she just, I think she stepped out of it. And then when the second one came along, I guess Maggie Gyllenhaal actually uh, called her and asked if it was okay. And she said, of course it is. But I think she just had enough of all the, the hating, but which is, which is not okay. It's not okay. And I, I get that there's a certain standard. And like I just said, I, I felt like she wasn't up to par. I, I felt like she was a Cameron, Cameron Diaz in Gangs of New York, the only person who did not belong in that movie. <laughs> wow. So mean. Just, I know, I know. Kidding. Seriously, seriously. Yeah, we're not okay. <laughs> I didn't even think about her being the weakest link in the show, but or movie, but hmm, good to know. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, it, it's, 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 it's subjective. That's a beautiful thing about anything like like art related. It's, it's just how I felt. I didn't necessarily feel the the great vibes. And I think Maggie Joan Hall is a, a a way better actor in general hmm. than Katie Holmes is. So even though not as pretty to look at, <laughs> I, I find her her whole role and and. Uh, which we'll talk about in any second here, her role role in Dark Knight was a very important one, and I think she just pulled it off and made the whole thing feel believable. She was... Katie Holmes was Tom Cruise's girlfriend for a while, wasn't she? Uh, wife Maybe. for a while, yeah, and then she found out that... I mean, she didn't find it. She was tired <laughs> of the whole, like, oh, Tom Cruise, you're in this weird cult, Scientology, and I don't want to be a part of it anymore. So, yeah. Yeah, she got out of that, thank God. <laughs> Yeah, but that's, yeah. that's funny enough, the best thing that, that Katie Holmes ever did was Tom Cruise. <laughs> Jeez, so much <laughs> I know, anyway. I know, I know. Uh, so, yeah, um, you and I both agree, my friend, that Dark Knight is the best of the three. And, yes. and even though uh, their other two are so fantastic, Dark Knight is special. And uh, I think the reason is because of uh, mostly uh, Heath Ledger's Joker. Oh yeah, for sure. He's the the best Joker I've ever seen. I know there's some like other ones, but yeah, his his he was like flawless in that movie, pretty much. Starting with the opening bank robbery scene, that was just a sweet way to start a movie. It was just he was tricking his own guys, killing his own guys, and he just I don't know pulled out the role perfectly. You any anything you'd want to see in a Joker, he he did it. I mean, he did. He did. I will say, Joaquin. 
stuff. Keen Phoenix was pretty close, close second, but he might have got his inspiration from Heath Ledger. Who knows? Hey, well, you know, and, and I, I will say, like, uh, watching all the Jokers, first of all, Cesar Romero played the Joker in the, the 60s Adam West version, and even though that was over the top, Cesar Romero deserves some love because he really was for the first. And then Jack Nicholson, I mean, of course, Jack Nicholson was great. Yes, it was in a Tim Burton kind of movie with, with you know, he's sitting there in the museum with the uh, Prince music playing in the background while he's spray painting art, and you're thinking, this might not be the Joker that, you know, whatever. But it was still fun and great, and especially for the time, Batman still still day. Batman, the first Batman, eighty nine Batman, still holds up for a lot of people. But yes, Heath Ledger's Batman, it, it caught everyone off guard. Whenever the movie came out and people were watching, they were. I mean, there's this guy who's just a normal uh, guy, thirty, you know, four year old man, and he scared the crap out of me the whole time. And it, 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 like, okay, you're just an actor, but you were doing so well. All your mannerisms that you're doing, the licking the lips thing. Yeah, it was to keep your your prosthetics on, but still, the fact that you did it so much and it was able to help with the whole oddity of you, and then telling everyone how you got scars in a different way every single time. Pretty much telling everyone you don't know crap about me. I'm, and then just burning money up and not having any idea of like he didn't wanting no power whatsoever. Just literally wanting chaos, and I love that. Mm-hmm. And the problem with him doing his thing after he passed and then everyone else was going to take up a, a different mantle and even change it up a little bit. And sadly, the next the, the victim that had to deal with it was the first movie of Suicide Squad. And, and poor Jer- Jared Leto, even though I wasn't necessarily a fan of that performance of it, he's a good actor and I was excited to see him do it. But he was sadly, Heath Ledger's performance was so perfect. They literally doomed people for a while. Luckily, Walking Phoenix being, in my opinion, a way better actor typically than Heath Ledger was. He's, I mean, yeah. he, he always brings a, a Heath Ledger type of a, a role in all of his movies, no matter happy, sad, weird. And so whenever I found out he was on Joker, I'm thinking, well, I really can't think of a better person to try this out. And luckily, it paid off very well. But I would say, I don't know how you feel, I would say that their performances. Uh, he, he might have been inspired, uh, sat, uh, maybe a little bit by Heath Ledger, but I, but I don't see anything that's even, like nearly really the same. It's like a different kind of crazy. Hmm. Uh, where Jared Leto, I could see his acting kind of happening in his head. And I'm like, oh, I, I almost felt sorry for him. I'm like, oh, buddy, you, you're not looking too good right now. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't the biggest fan of Leto's Joker. <laughs> He looked like he looked the part, but sure. I don't know. It just didn't feel, it didn't feel the same. I don't know. Every time Heath Ledger was on the screen, you were just like silent. You wanted to hear everything he had to say and watch everything he was doing. It was a masterpiece, pretty much. Mm. You said you, you said it perfectly. Yeah. Yeah, and like I heard some. He had some, some crazy. He went like went into like a hotel room for like months and just like practiced his voice and worked out how he was gonna be the Joker and. Wrote, yeah. a, wrote a diary and everything, and put pictures in the diary of like what, like 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 uh, certain movies, like Clockwork Orange, and just kind of trying to find the right, uh, like I said, voice, but also the right manners and the right idea. And then when you see the final product, you're thinking. I remember when, whenever they they told everyone that Heath Ledger was playing the Joker, and a lot of people were like, "Yeah, no, that's okay, that's okay." And um, I, I mean, I wasn't necessarily like that, but I was kind of like, well. Yeah. Because before that, you're thinking, okay, you know, you're, you're charming. You're in 10 things I hate about you and a couple of these, you know. Uh, and well, I guess, I guess what really kind of did it for him was being uh, with Mr. Jake Gyllenhaal himself in Brokeback Mountain. And that was, I, I will say, I mean, that was an excellent movie with excellent acting. And the acting was very good, especially with two straight men who are trying to be machismo in real life, but yet they're going to, like, you know, they're sitting there, and then Heath Ledger being an Australian guy is sitting there like, all right, Mike, let's go ahead and do this now. And then all of a sudden, hey, don't, don't touch me, don't touch me. Like, oh, geez, this is getting intense. So I could see certain elements, but for the most part, I just thought he was fun and, and charming in his movies. But then all of a sudden you watch it, you're like, oh, okay, well, Al Pacino eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't have high expectations going into it when I was younger. Like, ew, he, he was just in a very, like you said, broke back mountain. I was like, oh. and I accidentally had my ex girlfriend at the time show me that movie. So I was like, what is going on here? Oh, hmm, 
okay, okay, I'm good. I don't need to watch this anymore. <laughs> but yeah, after watching that, I was like, he's gonna be the Joker in a way, but he stopped everybody. Yeah. Mm. And and, and, I, and and a lot of people were saying that it, uh, this role had to do with his death. And uh, doing a little research, I found out that it was it was uh, from his family. Actually, I saw an interview with his family saying that he had really bad insomnia all his life, and so he just had trouble with sleeping. And I guess he just mixed a couple of the wrong things together. And so it was uh, a lot of people were trying to demonize him as being like, oh, you killed yourself, and uh, what a loser, you couldn't handle the fame, you know, all these kind of things. And I'm thinking. No, he was just trying to go to sleep. I don't. Uh, what? What are you talking about? He wasn't like so stressed out from his acting as the Joker that he lost his mind. No, uh, an interview, inter- many interviews with him. Apparently, it was a dream come true, and he got to enjoy every moment of it. But yeah, they they, they wanted to change the narrative to where he, you know, oh man, this the movie was so intense as you can see from the performance that it literally killed him. No, it didn't. <laughs> Yeah, I believe that for, for a few years too, actually, until recently. I sure. found out he, he actually had like a chest pain too, so he's mixing his drugs together. And yep, yep. Over, he had a, a chest. Uh, yeah, he had a, like a, what is it called? He had a, um, like bacteria or some kind of yeah, chest thing. And you're, you're absolutely right, like a fever or something. But uh, yeah. it, it's a shame because he was only like 30, what, 35 or 36 or something like that. But yeah, he, it was very, very uh, wonderful role from him. And everyone else, like you said, everyone else just kind of takes second seat, including Batman, because of the fact, like you said, he's so captivating. And there's very rare movies. The reason why I brought up uh, the Cameron Diaz Gangs of New York is because even though Leonardo DiCaprio's in the movie, I could not take my eyes off Daniel Day-Lewis as the butcher because he was so magnetic. And it's and, and I say that movie because I can literally only think at the top of my head of like four or five movies that make me feel like I don't care what else is going on. That person needs to keep on doing what they're doing. And this is that movie. And so, yeah. the, the I mean, just like, even that moment whenever he's, you know, like giving uh, Batman like the whole like, eventually everyone will you know, like, we'll blow. We all have a breaking point. And it got, in, it got in Batman's head, and I'm thinking, oh, you just did more damage than anyone could possibly do to you because you he, you just mentally screwed up Batman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was definitely the star of the movie, it felt like, more than Batman was. Like, Yeah. I mean, if I had one thing to pick about this movie, it would be Two-Faced. The story kind of felt a little bit rushed and kind of cheap. Not cheesy, but... He just he became two faced and he died within like half an hour. <laughs> Being yes. two faced, really like a villain so much. His uh, his story of... was fine. I think that his build up was great as being the White Knight, being the person who he even says uh, eventually Batman's not going to want to do this job forever, and he he is going to rely on the just the justice system and everything to work itself out so he doesn't have to do this anymore. And he was about ready to start doing that, and sadly it is what got him killed, but. Uh, well, not killed, but you know, it's what got things rolling for that, and then, and then whenever he became uh, face, a uh, uh, two face, is whenever, yeah, I see what you're saying. It kind of was a quick little like, okay, I'm now I'm pissed off, and 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 then, you know, oh, I'm dead now. I get what you're saying. I get, I, I thought, and I remember thinking like, because he didn't look like he died. He looked like he kind of just like like you know like knocked him out or something like that. And then I I saw an interview. Uh, with uh, Christopher Nolan and Christopher Nolan says no I, I, he, he's dead he's definitely dead I killed him off and I'm thinking yeah. well why didn't you allow for Two-Face to have a maybe it's like be part of the third movie or something like that that would have been a possibly a, an interesting because yeah. because Aaron Eckhart the guy who played Two-Face I thought he was an excellent excellent choice he yeah. did it he, he killed it in every single way and then whenever he became Two-Face he was he was really mm-hmm. interesting in that for a few moments and then he died, and I was like, oh, well, that was kind of a quick little... And, and, and Two-Face is kind of a big character in the, the Batman world, so I was kind of curious on why they just killed him off real quick. And Harvey Dent, Harvey Dent himself was, like I said, he was the, the main DA of the whole city who was just like, oh, I'm going to bring everyone down. And he has a very important fleshy role, and they just kill him off. Yeah, and he was only with Batman on the screen for like two minutes at the very end, right? He does not, they never fight each other. They just kind of... He just saves Commissioner Gordon's kids and pushes him off, off the building pretty much. And mm-hmm. that's it. And he, and like, I just remember, was it Batman Forever where he, with Jim Carrey? Is that the one? Or yeah, Batman different? Forever with Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Where he, you actually, she's in the movie the whole time and fighting Batman. And it's just two different, two different versions of Two-Face for sure. Like not quite what I would have hoped for for that character. 
But uh, I guess yeah. I guess they were also with his uh, with his makeup job. They were going to go for more realistic, uh, which I mean, it looked pretty realistic. I thought for the most part, but they they had a much more realistic plan. But I guess it looks too real, and it was like like uh, gross to look at. And they, they, they just thought, well, we can't really have this in a Batman movie because we don't want to like make people throw up like Saw style. So they kind of dumbed it down to make it look a little uh, more corny on purpose. Just kind of had a little more of a comic book effect. And I'm curious in like how that would have looked uh, to see like it's just like this zombie looking guy like with a real burn thing, like puffy features or whatnot. But uh, yeah, his character was great. I just, yeah, you're right. They just kind of like shoved him to the side real quick. But I, I felt like they were just trying to get him to like uh, get the job done on uh, kind of proving Joker's point like oh well you may have stopped the whole bomb thing but guess what Harvey Dent he's uh, you know he was easily corruptible after I killed his woman and it just proves to you that anyone can be corruptible and I'm like ooh sting <laughs> yeah he looked just like the guy in uh, <clears throat> Gustavo Fring from Breaking Bad whenever he <laughs> cut out of like ooh I mean, all Batman had to do was like slap him on the face, and he would have been like, ah, he would have, it would have been much of a fight because his face is pretty much oh. right off. Oh, but yeah, yeah that's yeah. my only, only complaint about that movie. What was yours if you had any? If you had to say nitpick at it, or did you have any? There, there's any one, um, <laughs> one quote from it that I don't, I don't want to say this. I mean, if I'm being nitpicky, there's one quote that kind of I thought was stupid and corny, and maybe it was an Easter egg or something like that, but. There's a part whenever they are taking in uh, all the all of the gangsters. Whenever uh, Harvey Dent's like, "Oh no, I'm I'm here to take you," and he goes, "Oh, you're really gonna embarrass me in front of my friends? Oh no, they can come too because you're all arrested." That part, and then there's a part when a cop's getting him in the car and he goes, uh, uh, "See you ne- next trip. Have a nice fall." And I'm like, "Oh, you just said that stupid line, and I don't know why you said it." And it was in Dark Knight, maybe the best movie of all time. You said a stupid line. <laughs> oh, that's your biggest complaint. Not a bad thing, I guess. <laughs> no, no, and, and it really isn't. And there's there's so many good things. Obviously, there's so many amazing actors that we haven't talked about, and but the the reason why is because Heath Ledger. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it was just it was so he was so magnificent, and everything else was great. Christopher Nolan. Uh, Morgan Freeman, all these characters, Michael Caine, all these characters were always awesome, but Joker was so magnetic that everything else was just kind of background noise. And he didn't even die in the end of the movie either, did he? He just went to jail, I think. Yeah, right? he just went to jail. Yeah. So he... Hmm. Uh, Speaking of... Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, no. no. I was just going to... Uh, I was so, about, yeah. I was going to say, moving on to The Dark Knight Rises, we, we were just talking about this today or the other day. Um... We think this movie would have been just as good, if not not maybe not better, but if it was number two, or if maybe Heath Ledger didn't die or wasn't didn't just wasn't so good at the role. Like such a good movie as well, but it kind of got so overshadowed. By the second one. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, it should have happened. Uh, Batman Begins. Uh, well, the, the the problem with Dark Knight Rises not being the second one though is it does have an epic finale. The whole oh, like yeah. the whole like like war going on in the in Gotham City, you can't really have that be a second movie and then the third one is just kind of like oh yeah, there's one guy who's kind of messing around, mm-hmm. yeah. And I and, yeah. and I didn't think about that till now, so uh, I'm calling you out. I guess I didn't mean to because we, we did say earlier that that would make more sense. But uh, yeah, other than that though, uh, and we didn't know, and it's uh, we're saying uh, we'll talk about Bane in a second. But no matter who's going to be after the Joker sadly enough, they're not going to be near as interesting. And no matter who it is, just because of the fact that the Joker was the Joker and it was played so uh, perfectly and so uh, refreshingly different. But saying that, Tom Hardy's Bane was badass. Yeah, he was He was very convincing. He was the same guy as Venom, right? Oh, yeah. Same oh, guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, we never put two and two together till recently. Like, oh, that's the same guy. But maybe it was the mask. It was his voice. He was just an intimidating dude. Like, he was more of a big, bulky bodybuilder you don't want to mess with than a skinny, weird... Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and and the cool thing I liked, they kind of switched a couple things up with his character, but it was... It, it allowed for more realism, too, and just for a different take on Bane. Of course, uh, two uh, yeah. completely different things, though, is the Bane from... Uh, Batman and Robin 
and he was, that was that was yeah. yeah he was just a big old steroid scary looking freak but that's not really how bane is and if you know anything about the the comics or anything dave bane is a very intelligent and very like uh like you don't want to mess him just because he's very smart too but then that 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 version they made him just a big old like monster looking thing but then when you yeah. see tom hardy which before that like i think before that would have came out you would have seen things like warrior and there's another movie that he did where he's called branson where he plays a boxer and you, you you see a couple movies that you kind of see like these certain things you see of course you see him in inception he's in a place that's a, one of those sniper characters that helps him out and you don't really notice it's him until you watch it again after his popularity kind of rose but you're like oh cool that's so I've re- that, that was you that that's right that was you but yeah he's he's one of those uh he's a character actor where he kind of like gets really involved revenant is a prime example of Tom Hardy's effectiveness as just playing a piece of crap bad guy, and he does not only. Oh, yeah, right. I know, right? And not only is he playing a bad guy, but he's playing like this redneck, like, like oh, I'm gonna kill actor. you. Uh, he is a good actor, and that that's one of those things too. That whenever you see a character, and it could, it, a lot of characters aren't very good at it, but some are. But when you see any character who says, "Oh, I'm a big strong man, and you're gonna be scared of me," he is actually one of those people that actually makes you believe it. And when, and when he's walking around and he's kind of like almost part of this cult, well, I mean, League of Shadows is kind of a cult, so I, I, I would say, or whatever it would be called, Illuminati, whatever you want to call them. But he's at the very, very beginning of the movie when the whole thing's happening with the CIA uh, actor uh, Littlefinger, in the very beginning, whenever they, they, they kill him, there's another, like his like, right hand man goes, oh, let's go. And he goes, no, you will stay behind in the wreckage. And the guy's like, yeah. oh, okay, cool. I mean, and I'm thinking anyone who is that, has that kind of uh, loyalty, I mean, obviously, they're, they're, you know, this is, this is the guy right here. And, and this, his presence throughout the whole thing and how he pretty much says, oh, oh you know, Batman, you know, and you, you just adopted the dark. I was born into it. And he's just saying all these things, and, and, but yeah, he's backing it up. And the actor Tom Hardy is backing it up because you can't just have a strong man like Arnold Schwarzenegger in there and then like say, all right, Arnold, let, 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 let go. No, because as much as we all love Arnold Schwarzenegger, he cannot pull off that kind of uh, emotional like like uh, threat to us. And, like, yeah. the, the whole movie relies on like believability. And, and, and a good way to start off is whenever Littlefinger says, uh, oh, you're a big guy. And, and, and Ben goes, to some... And I'm thinking that's that's what a like a wise answer to say, and that kind of auto- automatically tells me the kind of character you are. You're not the typical villain who goes, "Yes, I'm scary to everyone." No, you're you're, you're saying like, "Oh yeah, to you I may be," but and, and, and that yeah. that just alone makes me feel like, "Ooh, this guy has some depth to him already." Yeah, he they run they also rounded out the movies from the first one to the third one with the same organization, the League of Shadows, and he wasn't more he was more like we said earlier, like a strategic guy than a chaos guy like the joker he was more like planning out his moves and mm-hmm. what he was going to do rather than just chaos and whatever happens happens burning my money with joker and stuff like that so it was, it was a good change and the first time i remember the first time in the movies where batman gets his butt kicked oh yes and it's in like yeah. we we're talking about this earlier today when you have to, like an actual fist fight and there's nowhere like for batman to hide and it's just like oh no we're gonna just fist fight I mean, guess what? Batman's in trouble. <laughs> in that case, yeah. Unless he's finding the skinny scarecrow or Joker, he's he's yeah. <laughs> this is the one time where he's getting his butt kicked. <laughs> and, using- and we didn't get to see that a lot. I mean, yeah, you'd have like the big guys, the big brute guys coming in there and doing their thing, and then you kind of see him having trouble with him for a moment. But typically, the yeah. villains that 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 he had to fight in all these movies weren't necessarily fighting with him. Like he never. I mean, he had, there was a couple of parts whenever he was about ready to go punched Joker, but then all of a sudden some dogs came out and ran after him because that Joker sticked on him. And, you know, so there's always something that Joker's able to do or that little motorcycle uh, chase scene where, you know, it, Joker's just standing there like, hit me! And, you know, Batman yeah. can't... And all these kind of, like, 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 like crazy okay. experiences. That, yeah, but at the end of the day, there's no, like, fist fight. And even Joker says, oh, you think I'd ever win in a fist fight with you? Yeah. He was always trying to fight him in other ways, basically. Mm-hmm. Threw Rachel out the window so he wouldn't be able to fight him, and he had to go 
chase her instead of fight Joker. And yeah, the car scene that was pretty cool too. <clears throat> the motorcycle, I guess it was. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but yeah, but, but, but there's like, but Bane's not just a big old like oh scary guy. He's a big old scary guy who, when you find out his backstory, and, mm-hmm. and you know like oh you were protecting Raja Ghoul's daughter. And then you got her to safety and then got damn near killed because of it. And then Raja Ghoul found out about this, went back with the daughter, and pretty much made you his right hand man. And this is all repercussions of from what Batman did, you know, ten years ago or what however long ago it was uh, with Raja Ghoul in the first place. And just just to know that this whole trilogy, you know, like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings is much more tight-nipped than the other three. It was like literally just one big movie. But it's nice to know that there's fruition where you see a complete circle like, oh, all those choices have consequences. All those consequences have good and bad. And I liked how Christopher Nolan is able to bring this complete package together and have a, a very wonderfulness to all of it. Yeah, I was going to ask you, why Why did he need a mask? I know in the, they show him in the flashback of, like, he got maybe punched in the face or something, or, like, did he need to breathe, or what happened? Uh, yeah, he, yeah, he needed to breathe. In the, in the comic books, he he needed it. Uh, it would give him, like, a steroid thing that would make him strong momentarily, but it was kind of like a like a drug thing. And But oh. they, they changed it up a little bit to where it would give him uh, pain suppression, suppressants and, like, pain killers because... Whatever they did to him, yeah, it caused him to not be able to pretty much uh, breathe on his own. So he had like a Darth Vader kind of thing. And you can see whenever Batman's fighting him in the street brawl, when he's punching him repeatedly in the face, you can kind of hear it breaking. Yeah. You can hear like the, yeah. the, 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 the like clink, clink kind of thing. And then all of a sudden you start hearing like, and then all of a sudden he's just kind of like getting all weird. Like, oh no. And it's because like Darth Vader syndrome where he's like, oh, now I'm going to die soon. <laughs> If he only would have known that earlier on, he could have beat him. Yeah. <laughs> but he was only adopted in the dark. He wasn't born. Yeah. That, that was really bad. Yeah, that's why they, that's why they fought in the, in the light. <clears throat> that in the final, they said that that's the only scene Batman's fighting in the daytime, in the, in the final movie. And Every it, other scene's at night. Yes, and, and I can see why. that. I mean, when you think about it, that's like career suicide. When you're like, oh, let's have Batman, this character who's known to be this scary, mischievous bat, and all of a sudden he's sitting there like in the, the day like, hey, everyone, it's me, Batman. That's <laughs> enough kernel. You shouldn't be out in the, in the <laughs> Right, day. right, right. You're going to be a wimp when you're out in the daytime. But uh, the beautiful thing about the, the whole message of this one, which it to me, I mean, yeah, the second one, The Dark Knight has this empowering message where – Batman proves to some degree that these people didn't break, but then uh, Joker got the last laugh, um, literally, <laughs> because of what happened with Harvey Dent and whatnot, and then the consequences that it had with uh, just with the, the psychological effects that have Bruce Wayne. But the third one has much more of this whole, um, our people are now being threatened. Uh, the, when they cut off all the whole things where the prison just kind of takes over that whole city, and you're thinking, okay, Gotham City is probably like the size of New York City or Chicago or yeah. something like that. So it, this is, you know, millions of people that are, are like blocked here and enslaved here. And so it's kind of when you really think about it, like, wow, this is a big deal. And then all of a sudden, here's this guy that not too long ago we were all thinking was part of the problem. And then whenever Commissioner Gordon had to tell everyone, like I lied and Harvey Dent was actually the bad guy at the end of the day. That's because, you know, he was made to. And, but... This all caused consequences, but when you see Batman is like in the light and everyone's like all the cops are with them and they're all punching the bad guys, it was really kind of like this really like, you know, like a civil war was happening, but the good side was winning kind of thing. And it was really just a very empowering message. And, and that's why I guess they, I think that maybe they should have had kept it like it was with the third one being uh, the Dark Knight Rises. And it kind of shows a certain degree of like, like, like change within Batman. Hmm. Yeah. So he didn't die at the end of three. That wasn't like a dream or anything, because uh, Alfred saw him in another country, right, with with Catwoman or whatever. Anyway. Yes, and I they, they do that thing. Christopher Nolan does that thing, but uh, with the whole like keeping it somewhat vague, like oh, was he just imagining that one day he would be looking at him and seeing that? But how I look at yeah. that is there was no damn Inception device that was spinning around. Okay, so in my mind, yeah. that definitely <laughs> happened. <laughs> Another little thing in the movie that I loved at the very end because it was so subtle. Maybe you realized it during the movie, or, or, or maybe I was just too slow, but how they snuck Robin in there at the very end, like the cop was, was Robin. What's his name? Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. 
Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Like yeah, that. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yep. Yeah, I, I loved how Joseph Gordon-Levitt was a, the Robin. Like, I mean, setting up because Christian Bale's not too old, and he could still come back. I don't know. They could make a cool Robin movie. I mean, he was believe he wasn't like a cheesy playboy like the other Robins in the other movies. He actually felt believable and pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And he's still young. Dude. And, and never know. throughout the movie, they were, they were, throughout the movie, they were sprinkling it in there too, Dave. Uh, it wasn't necessarily just even at the end. Throughout the movie, they were kind of having this like, oh, this cop right here, like he's uncorruptible. Like they kept on trying to mess him, and he's just like, no. And so he kept on going behind the back of the, and that's yeah. why uh, one, uh, eventually Batman goes, hey, if you're gonna fight alone, wear a mask. And he was he was pretty much like kind of, and my what I thought at least he was kind of saying to him, the mantle is now yours kind of thing like and so that was kind of like a, a big hint right there and then when they said the whole like robin thing i'm like well yeah <laughs> that point is, I knew the, yeah it took me till they said that i was like oh cool but they never went with anything with it maybe they're just teasing us for who knows <laughs> but it, it, it'd be a great one if they could bring bring back christian bell or even just a standalone robin movie would be kind of cool with him in it Oh, I was wondering if that's what they were planning on doing, but Christopher Nolan and Christian Bale both have said that they were only going to do three no matter what, and and mm-hmm. I respect that. And in fact, I probably don't want them touching it now, anyways. Maybe maybe Christopher Nolan could like be the executive producer or something like that for Robin. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like the trilogy was, I think, perfect. Yeah, we would like to see yeah. Chris Christopher Nolan style do four hundred more movies, but I don't want to tarnish the uh, beautiful thing of that these three movies were and because they in my mind they were perfect movies and uh, a, a, a almost perfect representation of what I thought Bruce Wayne and Batman was uh, um, I would say one thing that the, the the key takeaway that I did not like from these movies and it's only one thing it's really only one thing and it and, and to me it's, it's important but it did not really affect the movies for me because the movies are so damn good but uh, something that that my cousin Lucas actually mm-hmm. had brought up and even though he has a little small pea brain he actually does have a good uh, he actually had some good things to say about this he said that Batman should be the world's greatest detective and he wasn't. He kind of had Morgan Freeman's Lucius Fox doing all of the detective work, and then he would just kind of make his way to the places and use the gadgets, and whatnot. But when you watch, when you read the old comic books, a lot of times Batman was in the crime scene, which you see in the the new movie. You can see in the trailers, but he's in the crime scene, kind of just with like you know, like like hiding around and. and uh, doing his special little gadgets, looking for blood and whatnot, and then finding something that the cops missed and what or something like that. They don't really show much of that, but that's a small thing. Like you know, he's supposed to be the world's greatest detective as well, like kind of like a Sherlock Holmes, but also a Batman. So they didn't show that as well as I would have liked. But that's one small takeaway from these movies being damn near perfect. Yeah, maybe they did that for time reasons or something. Cause- mm-hmm. They did a, he did a little bit of it with like figuring out who Catwoman was in real life, mm. like a lot of fingerprints and why she stole his her necklace, his well, mom's necklace. And Kate, and Kate, uh, that's Anne Hathaway in real life, of course. She was really good. Yeah, I liked her. I liked her. Whatever you turn around in the story, how she was a bad guy turned into a good guy, kind of. Mm-hmm. At the yeah, end. yeah, she was helping Bane do all this stuff, and then she realized uh, that she just kind of went against the like what she even kind of believed in because she was like oh I'm going to be a thief and whatnot but I'm not a bad person but then she did that and realized her, the weight of her consequences and then luckily she was able to uh, re- have rebuttal for him and she was a good character too and she wasn't overly done or anything like that they said all these characters were splashed with such you know perfectness and I like also how Scarecrow was also in uh, the the second and third one too he was a, he was in the third one playing the judge and just condemning people to like die or be banished into the ice so i like how they kept on just having these little fun little things throughout the whole thing and it's just uh i mean in closing up david i would say that that the dark knight trilogy they really they wanted to get the the idea of batman the the understanding of the the mystery of him but also just the the spirit of batman and the darkness and the sadness and the somberness of all these situations and christopher nolan was a perfect choice for doing it and I would, I would say, like, you and I t- today just, uh, we were talking about how, you know, he might be considered the best director of all time up there with James Cameron or Steven Spielberg or someone like, like that who's been, like, tried and true, Quentin Tarantino, for pretty much 
you know, since movie one to still. So there, there is something I can say about that, and it, it, it it's nerve wracking that other people are trying to make Batman movies after <laughs> after he did because he was so fantastic. Uh, good luck to you guys, and uh, but but Christopher Nolan's the man, and Batman movies were freaking awesome. Yeah, I think I think I remember you asked me this in Star Wars, one of our other movie or podcasts. I think this is my top, my third favorite movie series or trilogy of all time. Where would you rank it? Yours in your top five, ten, whatever. Okay, so I've 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 had issues with this. I've talked to you about this many times over again. Uh, the Star Wars trilogy, although, are my favorite. Lord of the Rings trilogy is better quality. Okay, now that say what you want. One came out, you know, thirty years before the other. Say what you want. I'm not. Yeah. I'm, not I'm not judging uh, one or the other. I'm just saying. I would say that Lord of the Rings, pound for pounds, are better movies. So I would say it goes Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and then Dark Knight trilogy. Cool. We have the same three, just in slightly different orders. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, 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 David, thanks, buddy, for coming on. I appreciate it, my friend. And as usual, we'll talk about the topic very soon, buddy. Yep, thanks for having me on. Hope you guys enjoyed the intro and this podcast. It was fun to do on. Always good to be on. See you next time. <laughs> All right, take care, guys. Yeah. Bye, buddy. <laughs>